Fatal Fury Retrospective. Now, don't get it twisted. I love me some Street Fighter, a bit of Mortal Kombat, and especially some Bloody Roar. But if there's something I could talk about for hours, it's Terry Bogard, The Line System, Southtown, and of course... Yes. While plenty of people get plenty of nostalgic talking about old button bashers, for me there's a certain je ne sais quoi about the Fatal Fury franchise that stirs the hungry wolf within my soul. It pushed narrative and character relationships way harder than Capcom or Midway were at the time, and was always trying something new, whether it be from a story or gameplay perspective. And it's there, in the nuances of each installment, where I'll be examining just what makes this Fury oh so fantastic. So grab your trucker hat and get ready to Rising Taku! Cause it's time to get Fatal Fury in the ring! It's 1991, and SNK has just released Garou Densets, or Legend of the Wolves, in game centers all across Japan, which was then localized as Fatal Fury in the rest of the world. Now, if you were a kid and saw this cabinet in 91, the year of Street Fighter, and dismissed it as some lazy clone, well, that's just straight up PREDICTABLE! But I wouldn't blame you. See, Fatal Fury was developed well before Capcom's blockbuster had begun busting any blocks. In fact, SNK had poached several staff members who worked on the original 1987 Street Fighter, including its director, Takashi Nishiyama, in an effort to become the king of the fledgling genre before Capcom could, and obviously that didn't go exactly as planned. Now, their intent was for Fatal Fury to crush the original Street Fighter in every conceivable way, and in that, it very much succeeded. Better graphics, sound, controls, three playable characters, and allowing players both horizontal and vertical movement via the glorious line system. It told the story of two brothers pining for revenge against local mob boss Geese Howard, who had their adoptive father, Jeff, killed ten years before the events of the game. To do this, Terry, Andy, and their friend Joe Higashi enter a martial arts tournament hosted by Mr. Howard called King of Fighters and take on all comers in their quest to get said revenge. These all comers included Tung Fu Ru, Richard Meyer, Hao Jai, Duck King, Raiden, Billy Kane, or Billy Kane in some circles, and Michael Max, perhaps the most forgotten fighter in SNK history. Once you've plunked in a quarter, you take a tour of the fictional Miami-esque coastal city of Southtown, where you can choose between opponents in set cycles until you fight all the way up to Big Boss Goose. Every few opponents, you're rewarded with a cutscene of Geese's sodium levels getting higher and higher with every win, which really ratchets up the tension. And after each cutscene, you'll take a breather playing an in-universe arm wrestling arcade game and absolutely embarrassing a variety of legally distinct WWF superstars. Now, while it's true that Terry, Andy, and Joe are the only playable fighters with the rest being computer controlled, the three wild wolves at least have their own distinctive movesets. Fatal Fury embraced 80s action movie formula, which is something that set it apart. The fact that everything took place in a centralized location with clear motivations for its heroes and a central villain was a deliberate choice by SNK. They wanted a more cinematic feel and to tell the story behind the fighting rather than just be a bunch of rando matches, which is what a lot of its competitors, Street Fighter included, boiled down to. The game emphasized fighting the computer and seeing the end of the story, and all of the computer-controlled opponents had their own unique attitudes and gimmicks. Richard Meyer could hang upside down from the ceiling, Billy Kane would get new canes tossed at him every so often, and Huao Jai would get all sauced up and become super powerful in the middle of the match. So while it did seem like a Street Fighter ripoff to most, it actually had a lot going on that was different underneath the surface. As for my own personal memories, I actually never played Fatal Fury until years and years after its initial release, as by the time I got a Super Nintendo, its sequels were already out. While it's the clunkiest and slowest of the classic series, it's still pretty amazing everything SNK was able to cram in there, from the story to the line system all the way to the minutia of the world building. However, Street Fighter 2's advances in both graphics and sound via the CPS-1 board, coupled with 8 playable characters, smooth 
gameplay and being released months before saw it become the king of the fighters rather than Terry Bogard. Fortunately though, Fatal Fury was a success in its own right and was never too far behind the World Warriors in terms of arcade profits, so it was enough for SNK to greenlight a variety of ports like all those you see here. While that was happening though, the arcade team pushed forward with a sequel, but this time informed by the massive success of its Capcom counterpart. Fatal Fury 2, known in Japan as Hungry Wolf Legend 2 The New Battle, released just a year later and followed the traditional arcade fighter setup to a T. Eight playable characters from around the world, four bosses, and a lot less story. What they did retain was the line system, which saw a few extra attacks and options, but also made a lot of projectiles useless. You could also dash backwards, which was a new thing in 92, and adopted the four button attack setup that SNK would make famous throughout their entire history. Fans to this day still have the letters A, B, C, D dancing across their dreams. The sequel stages were taken from around the world, so Japan, Australia, England, etc. Now, a few of the boss arenas also contained hazards which could cause damage if you were unfortunate enough to be sent careening into. One of the biggest changes to the gameplay though was the desperation move. When you were at 25% health or lower, you could perform the patented SNK pretzel motion to unleash the Power Geyser or Screw Upper, and in the CPU-controlled final boss's case, the dreaded Kaiser Wave. Interestingly enough, the concept of Desperations technically started with Art of Fighting, Fatal Fury's sister series, but since both games came out a mere two months apart from each other, it was clearly an idea that both development teams had shared. But it wasn't just the gameplay that saw some changes, with Geese having been knocked out of his high-rise headquarters by Terry and was legit 100% for sure super dead, the King of Fighters tournament was taken over by the new monster heel on the block, Mr. Worldwide himself, Wolfgang Krauser, who, not content with the contest staying regional, decided to take a global. This expanded cast included Terry, Joe, and Andy, of course, but adds in Kim Kapwan, Big Bear, who's just riding wrestling under another gimmick, Japan's Jubei Yamada, and we conclude with the portly Cheng Sinzan. Now, moving on, we- oh, wait, wait, hold on a second. By the way, you may have noticed that a very important character from the Fatal Fury series was not included. Ah yes, my Shirinui, the forever bouncy Konoichi who helped get many fans through their developmental years. As for the bosses, the uh, Quartet of Lords, legally distinct from the Four Kings, mind you, included Axel Hawk, Lawrence Blood, Billy Kane, and good old Wolfie himself bringing up the rear. Fascinating fact about the Earl of Stroheim, he loves carving stonework. I'll chisel your gravestone. Sleep well. Fatal Fury 2 was smoother, more responsive, had a stellar soundtrack, and saw a big bump in graphical fidelity, all of which made it way more successful than the first game. The amount of ports were then increased, with Takara, an SNK subsidiary, handling the conversion process onto 16-bit machines. They even published a Game Boy version, developed by an outside studio named Sun L, that looks like one of the earliest examples of an SNK handheld game having a super charming and super deformed art style. Fatal Fury 2 was the first in the series I had ever played. I recall going to a birthday party where this was in rotation and being in awe of the music and detail in Terry's iconic train stage. It's a marked improvement over the first game and plays a whole lot better, and while I would never own it myself, it psyched me up for the next big entry in the saga. <laughs> SNK had worked extra hard to make Fatal Fury 2 competitive in a very competitive market, adding in features and gameplay that Capcom wouldn't even touch until years later. With that in mind, they felt now was the perfect time to reiterate on what they had done so far and to simply dial it up to 11. Thus, Fatal Fury Special was unleashed in 1993 and for a time was seen as the absolute pinnacle of the franchise. Essentially, it was the turbo slash super slash rainbow edition of Fatal Fury. 2, featuring a non-canon storyline and several returning fighters. The roster was increased considerably via bosses being made playable and returning from Fatal Fury 1 were Duck King, Tung Fu Ru, and Geese Howard. Uh, he's back 
and you better get used to it. It's going to be happening a lot. There was also a hidden 16th fighter, but this one would be familiar to SNK fans. The Invincible Dragon, Ryo Sakazaki, seen here. <laughs> I'll take it from here. <laughs> could be fought at the end of the arcade mode, but only if you beat every opponent and boss without losing a single round. Do that, and you literally unlock a dream match. Now, that might seem manageable at first, but for whatever reason, SNK decided that by default, you had to beat all 15 opponents in a row. In most other games, you have to go through a ladder of like 8 or 10, but SNK said, oh no, you're gonna earn this shit. While Rio wasn't playable in the arcades, he was made so in the home ports via a code, and while this could have remained a one-off bit of fan service, it left an indelible mark on SNK. The fan response to this cameo was so good that it inspired them to take the concept even further, combining both Fatal Fury, Art of Fighting, and constructing a new story with fresh characters and simply calling it the King of Fighters! Fatal Fury was no longer the sole representation of the KOF tournament, as both series would carve out their own respective plot lines going forward. In terms of gameplay, Special was largely the same as 2, but it was decided to increase the overall speed, as well as add in the ability to cancel certain normals into Specials, leading to far greater combo potential. This, in many fans' eyes, made Fatal Fury's Special far and away the most fun and competitive entry yet. Unfortunately, these positive changes and the huge roster were wasted in the home console market, because while the arcade and Neo Geo versions came out in 1993, all the other ports lagged behind them, showing up in 1994 or even 95 if you were outside Japan. So by the time they reached western shores, a lot of other fighters had stolen a huge amount of thunder, like Super Street Fighter 2, Mortal Kombat 3, or polygonal efforts on the PlayStation or Saturn. Curiously, there was no Genesis version of Special, which reportedly was cancelled in favor of a Sega CD port, and help, let's throw a Game Gear version on top, why the hell not? I owned Special growing up and played the everlasting fuck out of it. While it's a step down from the arcade in a number of small ways, I vastly prefer the soundtrack that's presented here. It just has a punchier vibe with more distinct compositions. <laughs> Whereas the arcade sounds a bit busy and overproduced, I guess? I don't know, maybe I'm crazy. I don't know. The massive roster combined with trying to defeat Rio kept me playing for months on end. And if you don't think the win quotes are the most hilarious things ever, then man, I don't think we can be friends. Wubba wubba, I'm in the pink today, boy! <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Die like your father, you pin-headed son of an ice cream maker! <laughs> What? Regrettably, all these super late ports didn't really help SNK's bottom line, as this would mark the last Fatal Fury game that saw a widespread console release for a good decade. This was a shame in more ways than one, because not only would it reduce Fatal Fury's overall visibility to the larger mainstream audience, many of its hardcore fans would never get to see the road to the final victory. Fatal Fury 3, or Legend of the Hungry Wolf 3, The Distant Battle, crack shooted into arcades in 1995, with the two-year gap between it and Special obviously being put to good use. The quality of the graphics, animation, and sound saw a huge increase, the gameplay was changed up considerably, and the entire roster saw a refresh. Okay, so uh, who, who do we got here? There's uh, Blue, Blue Mary and uh, this guy and- Oh no! Yes, Geese is back, for real this time. How, some of you are asking? Well, as it turns out, he faked his own death. His death via falling out of a skyscraper in a crowded downtown street. Um, I guess that's possible? Easy. Road to the Final Victory picks up three years after Fatal Fury 2, with Terry and friends hearing that the reports of Geese's death were very much exaggerated, and that he'd been slowly plotting his revenge all that time. 
Now, while you'd think the entire game would revolve around this revelation, it's actually just the side plot. The main narrative focuses on the Jin brothers, two 14-year-old martial arts masters who have landed in Southtown to find sacred scrolls of immortality. These scrolls apparently only reveal themselves when combat of old is repeatedly fought in the same location. That location? Good old Southtown. The twins have also employed the services of hired goon Ryuji Yamazaki, who would go on to carve out his own niche in the SNK villain hierarchy. So while there's new baddies on the block, what about the heroes? Kim, Jube, and Cheng sadly weren't invited, and I guess Raiden wasn't as well, but in their place were Han Fu, Franco Bash, Sokaku Mochizuki, Bob Wilson, and finally, the standout Blue Mary. Guess whom among these would go on to have a fruitful SNK career? Story and presentation were a huge priority for SNK with this new chapter, incorporating several cutscenes and dialogue sequences throughout the arcade mode, including a mid-boss fight with Yamazaki gloriously called an accident. A lot of this harkens back to how it worked in Fatal Fury 1, right down to the map of Southtown. You can choose the order in which you fight certain opponents as you watch your cute cartoon avatar travel to each location in a race to stop the villains. I, I don't know what it is, I, I just love this screen. Fatal Fury 3 also kicked off the trend of SNK designing absolutely gorgeous detailed backgrounds that will all take place in Southtown, feel distinct and varied. A highlight has to be Han Fu stage, a platform suspended high above the city with tons of parallax scrolling, making for an impressive visual feast. And that's not even mentioning the final stage, which might as well be out of Darkstalkers or, or Weapon Lord. In terms of gameplay, SNK expanded upon the line system, bumping it up to three different planes which you can now duck and weave into, which gave a fuller 3D feel to the proceedings. This also added more depth in how you approached your opponent, and they also added more offensive and defensive moves that interacted with each plane, like oversway attacks, anti-oversway attacks, and quick sway. You could also do short hops, block in mid-air, perform three different forms of supers, just yeah, SNK cramped a ton into Final Victory. Another notable change was a grading system that rated your performance against the CPU from E to S, and depending on that grade, you'll fight either Yamazaki or one or both of the Jin brothers, which of course encouraged players to improve their skills and to pump in more money. Getting good at Fatal Fury 3, however, was no easy feat for a number of reasons, one of which was due to the added complexity, while the other was due to the game's rarity. You either had to be lucky enough to live live near an arcade that had it were rich enough to afford the hot dog of gaming consoles, the Neo Geo. There were no mainstream ports of FF3, so a huge chunk of Western fans never even got to play Road to the Final Victory in the 90s. There was only ever a Saturn version that never made it out of Japan, so despite it being an incredibly important part of the saga, it remains one of the least played. That goes doubly so for me. I only ever saw screenshots in EGM of Final Victory victory growing up, but holy crap was I blown away when I saw it. Just seeing the select screen alone was enough to send me into a brief coma, it looked so cool. It had this only in Japan style mystique to it that resigned me into assuming I'd never get to play it. When I did via the first Battle Archives collection, or maybe it was a few years before that, maybe on Kawax, I found it to be an incredibly impressive game for its time that feels a bit off in certain respects. Since it's nestled between between the classic series and real bout, it has a sort of awkward stopgap feel to it, where they didn't quite nail down what they were attempting to do. Part of this had to do with a major disruption with its creation. In an interview with Retro Gamer, current SNK boss Yasuyuki Oda explained, Fatal Fury 3's development was stopped due to the Great Henshin Earthquake, and then we had no other choice but to release a game of lower quality than expected. That lower quality comment was probably due to the fact that the team simply didn't have time to add in more characters or set up location tests to smooth out any issues players might have had with the new line system and the insane requirements to pull off the new hidden desperation moves. So Final Victory, while performing solidly in arcades, didn't see the same success or critical reception enjoyed by Special. But all that meant for the Fatal Fury team was that they needed to train harder for the real bout. <laughs> Now, 
Now, this series was a bit confusing, I can tell you that for free. It was meant to be a refresh of the franchise, despite it coming out less than a year after Final Victory, but it also continued the storyline established in that game. Funny fact, the name Real Bout was chosen because it was one of the initial titles the team were considering when designing the first Fatal Fury before arriving on the Hungry Wolf motif. Since this series was meant to relaunch the brand, they all felt it was an appropriate moniker to add. While earlier entries in the series emphasized story and presentation, the purpose of Real Bount was to polish the gameplay and to add more characters to FF3's core roster. It's why a lot of the sprites from that game were reused here, but fortunately the story managed to progress, albeit ever so slightly. Geese was now re-established as the main villain because, as it turns out, it was actually he who acquired the Sacred Scrolls, and who, unlike the Jin brothers who wanted them for immortality, Geese straight up destroyed them so no one could gain an advantage. Damn what a boss ass move! With the twins now shoved in the corner where they belong, SNK marketed Real Bout as the true final conflict between Bogard and Howard. Hell, even the game's tagline was Sadaba. Gisu. Despite the twins and Yamazaki being demoted, all three were made playable, along with a few other additions. Both Duck King and Kim Tabwan were added, along with Billy Kane, now happily working for Geese once again. Ah, what a power couple! They look so good together! All these inclusions made the roster balloon back up to 16 total fighters, matching the series high set by Fatal Fury Special. Gameplay-wise, SNK simplified things as much as they could while still retaining Fatal Fury 3's sound ideas. It reverted to a three-button attack setup, a weak, medium, and strong, with each animation varying between being a punch or a kick. The fourth button directly controlled the line system actions now, which made it easier for players to remember when compared to the multiple button presses from FF3. The biggest innovation, however, came in the form of the stages and how you progress through the arcade ladder. You started by choosing a particular venue in Southtown, whereupon you fight three opponents one after another, with the time of day changing with each match. So while a subway station will be packed during the first fight, it'll empty out by the last. This meant that while Real Bout had less stages overall, they each had their own distinct feel and a hell of a lot of interactivity. On each end, there were barriers that could be broken on either side, like a sign, a window, or even just a mass of people. Slam your opponent into this enough times, or have your own special move with, and you'll fall, which often results in hilarious animations for each and every character. Some of these are, are just extremely charming and fun, and there's multiple variations to each one. I honestly feel this added so much strategy and personality to the game, but sadly, many players, arcade ones mostly, thought the opposite. While SNK staff members look back on this feature fondly, feeling that it increased the drama and the tension, they did note that when quarters or 100 yen coins were on the line, arcade rats felt like it was a cheap way to win matches. In terms of ports, well, the declining trend that started with Final Victory continues here. It was released on the Neo Geo and Neo Geo CD, of course. There were also ports to the Japanese Saturn and the European PlayStation in what can I only assume might be the most rare version of a fighting game ever? Did you ever see a PlayStation disc of real bout hanging out in a virgin megastore bargain bin in like downtown London? It's unlikely. Sadly, the game never made its way over to North America in any form throughout the 90s, which is just so super depressing. Again, this is another one I never got to play when it was new. I have a vague, hazy memory of maybe seeing it at an amusement park at some point, but didn't give it a proper go until it was released on the Wii Virtual Console, of all things. While I actually prefer some things in Fatal Fury 3, I absolutely adore and find it such a unique, charming, SNK-ified version of Mortal Kombat's pits or Virtua Fighter's ring outs. Despite it all, Real Belt made good on its promise to end the Howard vs. Bogard feud, saving the payoff for the big pay-per-view. How, may you ask? Falling off of Goose Tower? Again? Jesus, you think Geese would just reinforce those railings or something by now? For all intents and purposes, this death is canon. From this moment on, Geese would never appear in another game again, unless it was a dream or a nightmare. Two years later, Real Bout would return, but this time, it was gonna be special. 
Now you'd think this would be another iterative entry with a few extra characters, but no, this is a full-on sequel with completely redrawn sprites, a different presentation, and some rather big gameplay tweaks. It retains the cast of the last game, Sans Geese, and slots in Krauser as the new main boss, so this is kind of the Fatal Fury 2 of real bout Fatal Fury, if that makes any sense. No, it doesn't. After this point, SNK started focusing less on the storyline and more on the gameplay and pumping up the roster. There's no cutscenes, story intros, or any special dialogue to flesh anything out. So yeah, we're gonna move this one squarely into the dream match column. As for those who received an invite to the Southtown Invitational, well, that would be Tung Fu Ru, Lawrence Blood, and Cheng Sin Zan. Nobody asked for him. So that's about four new playable fighters, but there is one more you can square up against in a secret match, much like Ryo in the original Fatal Fury special. Do you want to take a guess? Just, just, just take a wild guess at who the, it's Geese. Now look, while we all love the guy, y you gotta groan a little bit. Like, come on, the whole point of the last game was that you were killing him off. SNK, however, heard the fan outcry. Geese was still really popular, so they compromised with a nonsensical gimmick that's so bad, it's, it's just amazing. Mr. Howard can only be fought in a nightmare match, with the concept here being that the sheer memory of his evilness is enough to give him corporeal form. And it's like, okay, you, you, you got me. You said Geese was done, you lied, but nightmare form is so cash. While he's unplayable in the arcade release, he can be unlocked with a code in the home ports. And that brings us to the last little wrinkle of Real Bout Special's roster, EX characters. These have no storyline justification either, just evil versions of random fighters with altered movesets. There's Andy, Billy Kane, Blue Mary, and Tung Fu Ru of all people. SNK's intent here was just to extend the game's longevity and variety, and including them topped out the roster to 24 total characters, so you can see they were trying to make up for the thin roster in Final Victory. Now, while the number of fighters increased, the emphasis on stages decreased. The ringouts and animations were removed entirely, and in their place, all stages except for one were given a specific barrier that, if an opponent is knocked into, would stun them for a moment, leading to a free hit. While I'm sure this alleviated the salty complaints from arcade players, it didn't quite capture the same tension or charm as... <laughs> But this did allow SNK to make more stages overall, so I guess that's a fair trade off. Would have been nice if they had made Ringouts a toggleable feature, but I digress. As for changes to the fighting system, well, the line system was simplified once again, going back to two planes. I don't know why. Having the fourth button control line switching worked great last time, but if it's not evident by now, it was always a system SNK could never truly nail down, and even if they thought they did, fan feedback always seemed to sway them. In terms of ports, it's not great. Uh, again. Neo Geo, Saturn, and PlayStation, but not even a European version this time around. Strangely, there was a Game Boy, yes, a regular Game Boy release of Real Bout in 1998. Fierce Fighting Real Bout Legend of Hungry Wolf Special is a strange release in that it kind of ditches the SD look of the last handheld title for a style that tries to mimic the original sprites a bit more closely. I never played this one, but it seems to be pretty responsive and plays at a good clip, but what the game is most notable for is the inclusion of another special guest. Strap on your knee strings everyone, cause Yori Yagami appears here in his first and only time in a Fatal Fury game, and while his inclusion is never really explained, it's welcome nonetheless. Whoever created this character must be a genius. Man, it sure would have been cool if a character of his stature could have crossed over into Fatal Fury a bit more. Maybe make it a yearly thing where all the characters could duke it out. Oh, right. Yeah. Real Bout Special and its sequel, which we're going to talk about, are among some of the best looking 2D fighters of the era. And personally, I always preferred the brighter, more expressive sprites of games like this, Last Blade, and Kazuna Encounter to most, if not all, of the KOFs. 
I missed out on the entire Reelbout series during its heyday, but it's with Reelbout Special where I really started to appreciate the insane amount of art and detail on display here. While I still lament the changes to the line system and the ring outs, I have to admit the new style and the overall game feel was at its zenith, and it was only going to get better from here. And get better it did with Real Bout Fatal Fury 2 The Newcomers. Two guesses as to what they added here. So off the bat, this is another no story dream match, which would have been fine for special, but it's a little weird there's no narrative progression for a full on numbered sequel. Geese is just straight up back. He's, he's back. He's not even a nightmare or a zombie or a, a, a seraphim. He's just back. I thought you were dead. My death was greatly exaggerated. There are no other new additions except for the eponymous newcomers, which was a bit overdue as there hadn't been any brand new characters since Final Victory, so this was SNK's attempt to rectify that. Li Zhangfei, a young Chinese martial artist, and Rick Stroud, a quick-footed boxer, are prominently displayed in the elaborate new intro, and honestly, they fit in with the rest of the cast well enough. The first thing you'll notice is a drastic change to the presentation and character art, most notably in the select and versus screens. Well, why is everyone so pissed? But aside from that, changes are pretty minimal across the board. If you can believe it, line switching has been paired back yet again, returning to something more closely resembling Fatal Fury 2, and even then, three stages don't let you plane switch at all. They're locked 2D only affairs. EX characters have also been axed, so the only other real surprise when it comes to the roster is an extra CPU battle against a hidden character. Allow me to introduce Alfred Airhawk, a goofy pilot kid that looks like he wandered out of a random shonen anime you've never heard of. Points for originality, I guess, but he definitely feels a little out of his depth here. So while Real Bout 2 has clearly seen the least amount of evolution in the entire saga, the core fighting mechanics were so polished, the roster so stacked, the graphics so detailed, and the music so on point, there's very little to actually complain about. The Newcomers is so good that you can simply start the Real Bout series right here, and honestly, you wouldn't be missing all that much, except for... Of course. Predictably, as we've probably learned by now, this had the least amount of ports of all. No Saturn, no PlayStation, just the Neo Geo stuff, making it one of the least accessible games in the entire franchise, but not the most inaccessible. While The Newcomers is technically where the Real Bout series ends, there's actually another extremely important entry in Fatal Fury history that a good percentage of you probably have never heard of, let alone played. Real Bout Fatal Fury Special Dominated Mind is a Japanese PlayStation exclusive that never saw an arcade release and actually picks up the narrative from where the original Real Bout left off. With Geese having honked his last honk, it left a vacuum within the Southtown underworld and a new villain simply named White steps in to take over. To uh, deal with this new threat, Alfred is added in as a default character, along with a lengthy anime intro which seems to be pushing him as the new hero. Yeah, good luck with that. As for Walter White here, well, he might be one of the most unknown but still most infamous bosses in SNK history, and that's saying a hell of a lot. Leading up to his fight, there's a few quick anime cutscenes that honestly look really cheap. Not sure why this couldn't just have been done with all the amazing sprite work, but I guess they wanted to fill up the PlayStation CD. His cheap attacks and sneaky movement options make for quite a challenge to actually conquer, and even if you do defeat him, he launches a projectile that instantly game overs you unless you know it's coming, what the fuck? Dominated Mind also makes two big changes to gameplay, the first being no line switching, like at all. Why, why completely power dunk a system that's been one of its defining features for a random home port? I don't know, I don't have the answers here. 
but it's very possible SNK knew the PlayStation simply couldn't display all that 2D data, one of the weaknesses of the console, with all the extra characters, so line switching might have been removed due to that, to cut down on the overall frame count. But considering the system had been on thin ice for years, it's also possible that they were just done with it. The last change to the gameplay was the ability to cancel out of super moves and into an even more powerful super move. These were called final impacts and are the coolest thing ever. I don't care what you say. This is such a bizarre entry with a lot going on, so I don't know why it's locked to the Japanese PlayStation and never even saw an arcade update. Now, this is even weirder. If you were paying attention earlier, I called this the home port of Real Bout Special, not the newcomers. Yet, it contains Alfred, a character that debuted in the newcomers. Well, by the time this port hit the PlayStation, the newcomers had been out in arcades for months. Now, if you're wondering why they didn't just wait and port Real Bout 2 and add in the new content they were planning for Dominate in Mind, well, I can assure you, I don't know. So, yeah. Oh, one last thing. We gotta talk about the subtitle Dominated Mind. You see, White has mind control powers because of course he does, and takes over Billy Kane to act as his second in command because he's always sworn loyalty to Geese. Good man. So that's kind of the deal with White and the villains. Kind of cool, I guess? But let's be real, the subtitle should have absolutely been Final Impact. This Japanese home exclusive hasn't been ported to any other console or format since it came out. Hell, even both Battle Archives collections don't have it, and that's exactly why those things exist, to archive all the Fatal Fury battles! Just, uh, anyway. Dominated Mind is an incredibly obscure but nonetheless fascinating part of Southtown history. Now, clearly, SNK did all they could with the real bout formula, so what would be next? What would bring renewed interest in Terrence and the Fatal Fury crew? If you said, make it janky, ugly, and 3D, then you're sort of wrong. The answer is, make it janky, ugly, 3D, but also remake Fatal Fury 1 at the same time. Yeah, that'll put some butts in the seats. Wild Ambition was one of SNK's attempts to get over their pricey and not very good Hyper Neo Geo 64 arcade boards. Sadly, a gamble that would go on to be instrumental in damaging the company long term. They tried it with Samurai Showdown, and it failed, and they tried it again with Fatal Fury, and it also failed, but I guess it failed slightly less hard. In an attempt to salvage the whole thing, they brought this arcade game to the PlayStation, which by the start of 1999 was the most dominant console on the market, so fair play to them. They even finally saw fit to release it in North America, so they were going all out. But uh, thanks? We didn't get any real bouts, but we're getting this? I mean, I I'll take it, but I'm not going to be happy about it. I expect nothing. And I'm still let down. While the arcade original was bare bones, SNK put some extra work into this home port. Wild Ambition starts off with a lengthy, girthy, seven minute long CGI intro that certainly feels way more serious and gritty than Fatal Fury typically is. The bright, sunny city of Southtown looks way more New Yorkish than I remember. Huh. And, and yeah, it just keeps going on like this. Let's just move along. It's basically an alternate retelling of the story of Fatal Fury 1, with Terry, Andy, and Joe trying to punch Geese in the face. However, characters that never appeared in the original suddenly show up to the party. This full roster includes the three main heroes, Mai, Kim, Billy, Raiden, Yamazaki, and Geese, obviously, who is an absolute beast in this game. What the fuck is going on, dude? Ooh, man, that's gotta be embarrassing. Two new characters were added, and while the generic Roshi stand-in Toji is worth talking about until precisely the end of this sentence, the other newcomer, Sugumi Sendo, makes an impression. She's quite adept at professional wrestling, and while she has nothing to do with the overarching plot, she's unique enough that I'd love to see her appear in future games. 
The PlayStation port adds in a few extras, making Zhang Fei, who was locked in the arcade, a default character. Ryo Sakazaki in Mr. Karate Gear appears as a hidden fighter. And on top of them all, the King of Kings, Mr. Duck King. Gameplay-wise, there's not much new here. It plays like the later revisions of Real Bout, just slower and a bit shitter. The backgrounds are also a real step up from the gorgeous art we've been looking at for the last long while. Yeah, going with the flat, lifeless JPEG look of the Street Fighter EX series, which is really soul-crushing. Now, there is a new dodge roll move, which was the style at the time, and some characters have a few new specials and supers, but other than that, it's a bog-standard fighter. One thing I can definitely say is that Wild Ambition has a pretty solid soundtrack, with Terry's 11th Street theme being a particular standout. I really wish this could have gotten an updated, like, Dreamcast release with better models, some cleaner audio, tweaks, and a few more characters, and it could have gone a long way in exposing this game to more players, since the Dreamcast would become pretty well known for its strong library of fighting games. Finally, if you're gonna make the risky move over to 3D, j just go nuts with it. Remaking Fatal Fury 1 was never gonna excite a whole lot of players, especially after all the advancements the Real Bout series saw. So this release, while well-intentioned, wasn't really wildly ambitious at all. Weirdly, 1999 was one of the busiest years for Fatal Fury, with three games being made available overall, with one of those being its own dedicated entry on the Neo Geo Pocket Color called First Contact. This is one of the many great handheld button bashers on SNK's neat little machine, and it can be played really easily today. It's essentially a shrunk down port of Real Bout 2 with less characters in terms of selectable fighters, but still manages to maintain tons of character. Clear, expressive, super deformed sprites return, which is the only way I want to see them. While it keeps the super system dashing and short hopping of its big arcade brother, it gets rid of the line system completely, which is appropriate for a small handheld screen. In terms of the roster, it cuts Bob, Sokaku, Han Fu, Tongue, Duck, Mary, Lawrence, Franco, and both Jin brothers. Kinda sucks they took out every new hero who debuted in Final Victory, like even Mary, how dare! But it does retain Zhang Fei, and even Rick gets to star in more than one game. Good for him. The one really neat thing about the fighter lineup, though, is an exclusive character that debuts for the first time. Kinda. This is the mighty Lao, who first appeared for a few seconds, getting knocked around in the intro for Real Bout 2. Also, I have to apologize, I'm sorry Michael Max, this is the most forgotten SNK fighter of all time. Now, while there's not a whole bunch more to say about First Contact, it was still neat that SNK was trying to spread the fury over to their little handheld that could, but it would only serve as an appetizer for what was to come next. As the 90s were ending, SNK were dramatically dialing back their output, to the point where they were focusing precisely on two things, King of Fighters and Metal Slug. Fatal Fury, like many of their other franchises, was slowly being phased out alongside the declining arcade business and the rise of 3D and console gaming. The Fatal Fury team still had one left in the tank though, and they weren't afraid to try something new and fresh, since Real Bout had clearly run its course. They decided to move the series forward in a big way, and even though SNK as a company was on the ropes, their individual teams were still hungry to prove themselves. So in 1999, they wound up delivering one of the greatest 2D fighters of all time, and as of right now, the last main game in the Fatal Fury IP. This was... Garo, Mark of the Wolves. Garo is SNK at their peak, in my humble opinion. Jumping 10 years into the future and starting fresh with a whole new cast of characters, story, and gameplay systems. Garo tells the tale of Rock Howard, Geese's son who had been raised by Terry ever since his father's very timely demise. 
A new tournament is being held in Southtown, sponsored by a mysterious figure that would... Well, it, it's not Southtown, but, but Second South, because... South, Southtown 1 was destroyed by an orbital space cannon and KOF 2000. Look, I know it's stupid. Anyway, Terry is the only returning character from the classic series, with everyone else being brand new and bright eyed. There's Dong Hwan and Jae Hoon, Kim's sons. Look, there they are. As well as T Zok, Marco Butt Rodriguez, the saucy B Jenny, Kevin Ryan, who has a vague connection to Blue Mary, Hutaro Futaba and Gato, a sister brother deal, a ninja kid who's literally Naruto, and finally Freeman, an Iori stand in who's standing in for Iori who didn't want to stand in. There's also two bosses, the masked muscle that is Grant, and finally Kane R. Heinlein, who you could only fight at the very end and get your ending if your grade was high enough. Kane's deal is that he's the brother of Rock's largely unseen mother, who is named Rock's mother, making Kane his uncle. The sad thing here is that if you beat the game with Rock, you get an intriguing cliffhanger ending that was never resolved. Terry is here merely to guide Rock, because it was time to focus on a new generation. And speaking of which, unlike Capcom's first tries at Street Fighter 3, Garo was a fully formed, polished fighter on day one. Line switching is, is just gone, we're, we're done with that now. In its place were a variety of brand new systems, like Just Defend, a reverse parry-like mechanic that not only would give you frame advantage, but a small life boost as well. Then there was the Tactical Offensive Positioning System, or TOP, which will let you choose a portion of your life bar to gain a powerful offensive attack, as well as some other buffs. One other big change was the switch to more friendly Street Fighter-style command motions, throwing the old pretzels out into the garbage. And here come the pretzels! Our collective thumbs, thank you, SNK. Gorgeous locales dot second south, complete with their own classy mood setting intros and appropriately catchy tunes. But it's the game's speed, its polished animation, and the impact of every punch or kick that truly feels special. You can certainly pick up on the elements lifted from real bout, but it also feels like an evolution of it, while still dissing itself from KOF. Also, it has to be noted that Garo is a milestone in gaming based solely on the fact that it was the first to introduce Terry's legendary Are you okay? oh! And for that, I can never suck this game's dick hard enough. While Garo got the expected arcade and Neo Geo conversions, for whatever reason the Fatal Fury name was dropped altogether, something that the Dreamcast release Fatal Fury Mark of the Wolves made up for. Never really understood why SNK USA saw fit to change Big Marky Rodriguez over to Cushwood Butt, but didn't bother to translate the fucking title of the arcade game. Some really weird localization choices going on with Garo in general. Mark of the Wolves' impact is still being felt today, with several original characters returning and later KOFs and other fighters throughout the years. And while the slow decline of the arcade business and 2D fighters in general hurt this game's chances at mainstream success, it remains one of SNK's finest efforts. So, it's an even greater tragedy that SNK was working on a sequel that, according to Falcoon, was 70% completed when the company briefly went out of business around 2002. It would have featured a number of brand new characters, like a grappler and Joe Higashi's apprentice. Unfortunately, Yasuyuki Oda confirmed that all the data for this game was lost, so no chance of a build popping up ever. While Fatal Fury's DNA would linger on in KOF, the series has not seen a new entry since 1999. If you're itching to give any of these games a go, your best bet is through the Battle Archives collections, as well as the recent modern port of Garo, which got rollback netcode in 2020. And finally, if you're feeling brave, you can try to navigate through hundreds of arcade archives releases to buy the individual games you want. We still have a few bits of unfinished business though. In the early 90s, Fatal Fury was popular enough to spawn three animated features, specifically two OVAs which adapted the first two games and one motion picture that uh, does its own thing. The armor of Mars will be mine. 
And when I possess it all, I will become a god. <laughs> they are 90s as fuck, and I reviewed the first two here and here. And hey, I also recorded a commentary track on a recent official Blu-ray release by Discotech. Please do check that out. King of Fighters Destiny, the awful CGI animated series, had an episode dedicated to Southtown and the Bogard's origins. It features little baby Terry getting his iconic hat for his birthday, when suddenly... Predictable! Geese busts in and has a knockout DBZ-style fight with Jeff Bogard in the middle of suburbia. If you want to laugh, well, it's good for a laugh and not much else. Next up, and I didn't even realize this was a thing until this video, there was Garou Densets vs. Fighters History Dynamite, a bizarre Japanese cell phone game that saw you controlling various Fatal Fury heroes brawling through waves of Fighters History's characters. Yeah, I, I don't know what the hell this was supposed to be. Finally, and I've been dreading this, Fatal Fury's story was kind of continued, but through the vapid, soulless machine that is Pachinko. These are clearly not fighting games, and I hate them, but they do pick up some of the narrative, sadly enough. If you'd like to know more about them, and I don't know why you would, I suggest you head over to Thorgy's Arcade and check out his retrospective, as he is a braver man than I. Link in the description below. I'd like to finish off by talking about something far more potentially exciting than gambling and occasionally watching a cutscene. Earlier this year, Lizard Cube, the artist behind the graphics of Streets of Rage 4, live-streamed the creation of a bit of artwork. Artwork that was meant to show off what a theoretical Garo 2 could look like. Now, Lizard Cube's publishing partner has worked with SNK on a number of other projects, with one of them being the upcoming Metal Slug Tactics, that being .mu, who were also the ones that put out that modern port of Mark of the Wolves. Furthermore, Yasuyuki Oda has dropped several hints that Fatal Fury has been on their minds a lot lately, and made allusions that in between big releases like KOF, they tend to work on smaller titles, so it's certainly within the realm of possibility that they themselves or .mu slash Lizard Cube could resurrect the franchise in some fashion. Personally, I would just shit on my floor in joy if that were ever to be announced. Now, let's make it clear, I love me some KOF, and 15 is one of my most anticipated games of next year, but my heart lies with Fatal Fury. There's a reason its characters are among the most popular in SNK history. You don't see Kyo, Benimaru, or Mr. Big making guest appearances in other games. You see characters like Terry, Mai, and Geese. People want this franchise to return, as it has a history and style all of its own that make it worth revisiting. Wow, that was a really long video. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you know of any other games, fighting, or otherwise you'd like me to retrospect, let me know in the comments below, over on my Twitter, or enter the Southtown-based offices of the Flophouse VIP Patreon to nominate the game or series of your choice. See you next time, Lone Wolves, and thank you so much for watching.